Okay, so um, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to present uh, uh, some of this work. And thank you for all of the all of you that are uh, late uh, from Europe or from the East Coast for staying to this talk. So I will talk about uh, topology enabled uh, uh, unconventional superconductivity in a time reversal symmetry breaking bulk superconductor. And uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to uh, mention uh, uh, my collaborators. So most of this work was done uh, at UC Davis with my group, uh, in particular with uh, Jackson Badger. Um, and with some help with uh, Jing Fettinger and uh, the Kozlarich group uh, in, in the chemistry department and Daioki at uh, Toroku University. And I will also show some RPS measurements uh, uh, done in collaboration with the Vichy group, uh, NMR with the uh, Kuro group, and uh, some uh, electronic structure calculations from uh, uh, Yundi and uh, in one Pickett's group. And also we had some input from Shuntaro Sumita at ICANN. And the, the funding for this work comes from the UC Lab Fees uh, Research Program. And uh, most of what I will show uh, will be published uh, very soon. And when I mean very soon, I mean uh, very, very soon. In fact, according to uh, communication physics, it will be published online uh, in a few hours uh, at 2 a.m. for those of us uh, Davis time this night. Um, okay, so this, this talk is going to be about this compound, uh, lanthanum nickel gallium 2. And so it's a compound that uh, uh, crystallizes in uh, orthorhombic crystal structure, space group CMCM, -CM, with the uh, B axis that is significantly longer than uh, the A and C axis. And uh, this is, uh, here I'm showing the electrical resistivity as a function of temperature. And so you can see that this is a, a metal, uh, metallic compound and there is a superconducting transition at uh, two Kelvin. And these are our data on our crystals, but uh, the superconductivity was already known uh, since 1995 and it had been confirmed already in 2002. Um, and here I'm showing the uh, susceptibility measurements. And uh, so, you can see a nearly full shielding fraction in the uh, superconducting state. And this is the heat capacity at low temperature. And so that confirms bulk superconductivity and the, uh, uh, the anomaly in the heat cap, the jump at the superconducting transition is, um, is slightly smaller than the, the, the expected jump from the BCS value. So that indicates a uh, weak coupling. And at low temperature, there is no residual uh, uh, heat capacity and there is an exponential behavior. So that indicates that it's fully gapped uh, uh, with no evidence for superconducting nodes, a fully gapped superconductor. And the sum of a coefficient is about 14 millijoule per mole per Kelvin square. So that is, uh, uh, lanthanum nickel gallium 2 is not a heavy fermion compound. Right? Um, the fact that it was, it is a fully gapped uh, superconductor was also confirmed uh, before by uh, Wang et al. in 2016, and they did uh, penetration depth measurements down to dilution fridge temperatures, and they find uh, no evidence for any kind of superconducting gap nodes uh, in this material. So lanthanum nickel gamma 2 really looks like a, a, a normal conventional superconductor, and in particular, um, what I uh, want you to remember for the, the rest of this talk is that there is just one sharp and complete superconducting transition. It is uh, fully gapped. There are no evidence for superconducting gap nodes. And the structure is a uh, centrosymmetric orthorhombic structure. Now, uh, magnetism, so I'm happy to show this uh, very uh, recent data. I got, I got this slide uh, uh, just this morning from, uh, from Nick Kuro. Um, so, they did NMR measurements uh, on lanthanum nickel gallium 2, and uh, they essentially find, uh, so they did gallium and lanthanum NMR, and the coring gallium ratio is about one, uh, is about unit, order of magnitude of unity, and it's temperature independent. So that um, 
of course, we need to spend more time analyzing this, this, this data. And I'm also looking forward for uh, what happens below TC. Uh, but uh, as far as the normal state is concerned, that shows that there is no evidence for any kind of magnetic correlations in this compound. So that further uh, indicates that lantern of nickel gamma looks like really a conventional superconductor. But the situation changed uh, in 2012 when Hillier and uh, collaborators, they uh, performed muon spin rotation measurements and uh, they found an increase of the uh, spin relaxation rate um, below TC. Uh, and so that indicates that uh, the separating state breaks time reversal symmetry and they found an internal field that is about 0.02 millitesla. Um, and uh, so there are other kinds of uh, time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors. In fact, there was a nice review by Gosh and uh, collaborators uh, uh, last year. And what they find is that all these compounds, uh, either they have a, a complex multi-component superconducting order parameter. Uh, so you recognize some of, some of these compounds here. I believe we, we will have talks about uh, sensium ricinate and uh, the one to two uh, tomorrow and uranium ditelluride we had this morning. Um, either, uh, the, the, the compounds are nodal triplet superconductors, uh, or they have a non central symmetric uh, crystal structure. But uh, if you look at lanternum nickel gallium 2, well, um, lanternum nickel gallium 2 has uh, just one sharp superconducting transition and it has an orthorhombic structure, so it cannot have a complex multi component order parameter. Um, it is fully gapped. There are no evidence for superconducting gap nodes, so it is not a nodal triplet superconductor. And the structure is central symmetric, so it cannot be a non central symmetric superconductor. And so, in fact, uh, lanternum nickel gram 2 belongs to a new category, uh, is kind of unique in this uh, family of time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors. And I will show you that it is uh, a the first uh, time reversal symmetry breaking topological crystalline superconductor. And it does this um, because of a property that was unknown before, which is that the structure is a non symorphic structure. And so, why uh, was this uh, uh, not known before? It was uh, not known because the uh, previous structure, in fact, was wrong. So, all the previous studies on this compound, they were done from polycrystalline samples. And when you have polycrystals, um, you do a powder X-ray diffraction and the structure was found to be CMMM space group. But we grew single crystals of this material. And from single crystals, you do single crystal X-ray diffraction. And what we found is that the core space group, in fact, is the CMCM space group. And that is the non-symorphic structure. Um, so uh, before I discuss about uh, the non-symorphic st structure, let me tell you how we grew single crystals of this material. So we use the method called the solution growth. So we introduce pieces of gallium, pieces of lanthanum, and pieces of nickel into an alumina crucible. And for this course, we used uh, an excess of lanthanum and nickel. And then we raise the temperature, so at uh, 11, 150 degrees Celsius, the nickel will dissolve into the lanthanum and nickel, uh, lanthanum and gallium. And so we have a homogeneous liquid. And then we start a, a slow cooling process. And as you cool down at some point, uh, crystals of lanthanum, nickel, gallium 2 will uh, start to nucleate. And you keep uh, cooling down slowly. And then the crystals are going to grow bigger and bigger. And eventually, at uh, 800 degrees Celsius, we use a centrifuge to separate the crystals from the, from the liquid. Uh, now, so this is uh, basic solution growth, but uh, if you're familiar with this method, uh, you may have uh, noticed that I said uh, we used an excess lanthanum and nickel, and that is not at all what you would uh, do uh, if, you, if you try to guess how to grow these kind of crystals. You would probably use an excess gallium. And so in fact, excess gallium doesn't work here. 
uh, and it is probably the reason why it took so long to, to find a way to grow crystals, single crystals of this compound. Uh, so this is a picture of the crystals we get. They grow a plate-like samples uh, with the B axis that is perpendicular to the, to the, uh, uh, to the plane. And uh, they are fairly big. In fact, this is a picture of one of the biggest crystals you will have uh, ever seen in your life, I think. Uh, so I asked my student to check the structure of this compound, and this is what uh, it came up with. Uh, so that, that was not at all uh, the structure I was expecting. Uh, so more seriously, we also checked the structure, the crystal structure with single crystal X-ray diffraction. And it turned out that this was also not what we were expecting, right? Uh, so here I'm showing the precession image of the HKO plane. And uh, I superimpose uh, the model uh, for the CMMM structure, which is the previously reported space group. And so you can see uh, that there are several uh, uh, peak intensities that are not well reproduced by this uh, structure. And in fact, if you look along the, at the intensity along the line here between these two red arrows, you look at the intensity and all the peaks are way more intense than the uh, model would predict. And so instead, what we found is that the correct uh, structure is the CMCM -CM space group. It can account for all the peaks and then the agreement of the intensities are uh, much better. Okay, so that was, uh, uh, that was uh, an example of a wrong crystal structure that uh, turned out to be different once you have a single crystals. And, and uh, so the reason it was wrong before was, like I said, because there was only uh, polycrystals available. And so we checked that um, uh, if you do the, just the powder X-ray diffraction, uh, you can refine both of these structures, CMMM and CMCM, uh, with kind of the same, same level of uh, agreement. And we found an R value that is about seven in both cases. So it is really uh, only with single crystals that uh, you can distinguish between these two structures. And there is an interesting uh, historical uh, precedent to this. Uh, in my um, PhD, I studied this compound, uranium germanium 2 which is also an unconventional superconductor. It is one of the uh, superconducting ferromagnet. And initially this compound, uh, polycrystal samples uh, were made and the structure was attributed to be a CMCM space group. And in fact, uh, many years later, 30, 37 years later, um, single crystals were used and then the, the correct space group was found to be CMMM. So it is not the first time that these two space groups uh, uh, are, uh, are uh, uh, confused from polycrystalline data. Um, okay, so the main difference between these two space groups is that the CMCM -CM space group is non-symorphic. And I will show you that this changes, uh, this is uh, very important for the topology of the electronic band structure. Right? I will show you that it guarantees the existence of Dirac physics. So first, what is a non-symorphic uh, uh, space group? So it has a non-symorphic symmetry. Uh, and a non-symorphic symmetry is a symmetry that uh, does not belong to a point group. So there are no points that are left unchanged under the symmetry. And an example of this is, for example, in two dimension, a glide symmetry, right? So you have this uh, example of the footprint pattern and you have uh, a glide symmetry, which is a mirror followed by a translation by half the uh, lattice vector, so by uh, A over two. Now, by contrast, if you have a symorphic symmetry, then you have like a mirror, uh, normal mirror, all the points on the mirror are left unchanged. So that is a symorphic. And, um, and you get this, this, this pattern here with the, uh, no, no translation. Okay, now what happens uh, to the band structure? So as you know, um, if you have um, a, a wave function that has a, a wave vector uh, k, which is uh, pi over a, then it will diffract on the periodic lattice. And so you will have an incident wave and a reflected wave that will interfere and create standing waves. And then the two solutions 
uh, to the Schrodinger equation uh, gives you uh, two periodic uh, probability density for your uh, uh, wave function. So either you have the, the blue curve here or the red curve. So uh, either the electron has a high probability to be on top of the footprint or on top of the atom and no probability to be in between. And that's the blue one. Or the electron has a high probability to be in between and not on top of the atoms. Right? And so that's the, uh, the, the red one. And so now uh, these two solutions, they see uh, the potentials from the uh, lattice. And so um, if you have, for example, a repulsive potential, then uh, the, the, the red one will have lower energy. And so you will have uh, these uh, two different energies at the Brunelson boundaries. And that creates this, this gap, which is the usual band gap, right? Which gives rise to all the, uh, the uh, insulators and, uh, and, uh, and so on in, in condensed matter physics. That's the usual band gap. And it's nothing, to, nothing else than just saying the electrons prefers to be in between the atoms than on top of them. Now, if you look back at the non-symorphic symmetry, then uh, in both of these cases, the electron sees the exact same symmetric potential. So they have the same energy. And so you get, uh, uh, instead of, you, you don't get any gap and you get the band crossing at the Brunelson boundary. Okay, so lantern nickel diamond two has that kind of uh, 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 glide plane. So the plane is along the C axis. So let me extend the crystal along the C axis. And here you see, the glide uh, plane and you recognize also the zigzag uh, symmetry. And in three dimension, you can also have another kind of non-symorphic operation, which is a, a screw operation. So there is a two-fold uh, screw operation, which is shown here. And so every atom in the unicell will be related to another atom under this uh, screw operation. Okay, so now, this is the uh, Brinwin zone uh, of lantern of nickel gallium 2. And in pink is the plane uh, boundary of the Brinwin zone that is perpendicular to the direction of the screw axis. And so every band that crosses this plane will be twofold degenerate. Uh, and so we call this the nodal surface. And so, for example, and those are the results of calculations from uh, Warren Pickett's group. So if you look at the uh, band dispersion along a line that is crossing the plane uh, along the green arrow here, you see uh, a, a, a Dirac point here. And then another one along, uh, um, along the blue arrow that is also crossing this plane, uh, you see another one, okay? So you can see that lantern of nickel gallium two is a, a, a Dirac metal. And I say metal uh, because uh, the Fermi surface of lantern of nickel gallium 2 is very complex, right? You have, in fact, five uh, uh, Fermi surfaces. And out of five, four of them are crossing this nodal surface. Uh, so two of them, they uh, form uh, Dirac lines that are highlighted in blue. And then uh, uh, two other, Fermi surface 2 and Fermi surface 3, they form uh, this line uh, uh, that forms a loop that is highlighted in, in green. Um, so we can say that lantern of nickel gram 2 then is a Dirac line and a Dirac loop metal. And uh, uh, I point out that these features, these Dirac features are exactly at the Fermi level, right? There is no doping that is necessary. In fact, if you dope this, uh, this uh, system, it will remain a, a, a Dirac metal as long as the Fermi surface is crossing the nodal surface. And it will remain like this at exactly at the Fermi level, you will have the, the Dirac points. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, the symmetry analysis imposes the existence of this nodal surface. And then the best structure calculation, they show that the Fermi surface indeed across uh, this nodal surface. And we can also check this with uh, RPS measurements. So this is what I'm showing here, data from the uh, Vichy group. Um, 
So this is the uh, Fermi surface in the KY equals zero plane. So in the plane that is uh, in the cutting the Brennan's only half here, highlighted with this uh, this uh, pink uh, plane. And this is uh, here uh, adding the uh, the lines of from the the calculation. And you can see a uh, uh, very good agreement with the calculations for Fermi surface two and Fermi surface three. Now we can look at uh, the, uh, uh, the dispersion. So here I am showing the dispersion along uh, this blue line here, which is just before the, um, the, uh, the, the, the brilliance on boundary. And then I'm showing uh, one that is uh, exactly on the brilliance on boundary along this green line. And then another one that is uh, uh, after the zone boundary, so in the second brilliance zone along that red line. And so what we expect is that uh, for the middle one, exactly on the zone boundary, then we have the bands that are degenerate. And so you can see indeed uh, that um, um, the, the, the dispersion is becoming much sharper for this middle, gra middle graph compared to the other two, right? Um, and I forgot to say, so the lines are again from the calculations and we see again, very good agreement with uh, Fermi surface two and Fermi surface three calcula calculations. Now we can look at this in even more detail. So we can look at the Fermi level and look at the, uh, the uh, integrated intens intensity along a cut uh, at the Fermi level. And so you can see where the bands are crossing uh, the Fermi level. Sorry, I will get a bit of water. Okay, so for the blue blue line, which is inside the Brunner zone, uh, we can resolve uh, the two peaks, uh, which are shown as like two, Model by two Laurentians here. Uh, once you move exactly on the Brillouin zone boundary, we can no longer resolve two peaks. We just have one, one sharp peak. And then as soon as you move away in the second Brillouin zone, you can resolve two peaks again. So again, that confirms uh, that uh, we have this band crossing on the Brillouin zone boundary. All right. Um, so let's come back to these uh, uh, results from calculation here. So we have Dirac, uh, Dirac uh, line and Dirac loop uh, in lateral omnical gram two. And here uh, you can see I put two points in pink that are on the Dirac loop. And so in fact, in lateral omnical gram two, there is an additional mirror uh, symmetry that will protect uh, from the splitting from spin orbit coupling. So they will remain Dirac even under spin orbit coupling. Uh, and so I, I'll show now the results of the calculations with spin orbit coupling. And so you can see that uh, for the Dirac lines in blue, uh, there is a, a gap opening due to spin orbit coupling. So the Dirac point is suppressed and you have a gap instead. And that is the same as in graphene or the same as in many other Dirac materials. Uh, but uh, along the, uh, on the mirror, um, on this uh, pink uh, location, then you have, uh, even with spin orbit coupling, it remains uncapped. And so that means that we're gonna have this uh, Dirac uh, physics, um, this band degeneracy, uh, all the way down to the lowest energies. And so in particular, it will affect the properties of plantar of nickel gram two, all the way down to the lowest energy, and so in particular, also to the uh, affect superconductivity. So what happens to superconductivity? So here I, I show um, two uh, uh, Dirac points. So we have uh, four fold degenerate, right? Two bands and two spins. So let me separate all the four bands. Um, so. For superconductivity in general, to maximize the uh, superconducting condensation energy, the orbital part of the uh, Cooper pairs will be uh, 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 even. And then to satisfy fermionic um, 
statistics, then the spin part will have to be uh, uh, odd. And so we'll have S wave spin singlet. And if the spin part is triplet, then the orbital part has to be uh, anti-symmetric. And so we, we will have P wave spin triplet or, or something like that. But uh, in general, P wave has uh, nodes. Uh, so it is not favored. And so in general, S wave is favored and you get the uh, up spin at plus K that will pair with minus uh, the down spin at minus K and, and, and vice versa. And you get this S wave spin singlet pairing. But now because of the band degeneracy, we have this additional degree of freedom where the pair can be uh, uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric in the band channel. And so in particular, if it is anti-symmetric in the band channel, you can have S wave spin triplet or P wave spin singlet. And so if it is uh, S wave spin triplet, then you can have equal spin pairs uh, with uh, S wave, so with fully gapped uh, superconductivity. And I should mention that uh, this was, uh, uh, all you need for this is to have this band degeneracy. Uh, and so this was actually already proposed before uh, uh, for lanthanum nickel gram two as sort of the only possibility that made sense for a breaking time reversal symmetry without, without having any superconducting gap nodes. Uh, but what was lacking was uh, what we found, which is that you have topology and you have the band degeneracy. Um, so um, this is enabled by the Dirac physics and uh, the Dirac, the band crossings are enabled by uh, the symmetry of the lattice. And so these symmetries will also affect uh, uh, the Bogoliubov de Gen spectrum. And so this is uh, uh, what I'm showing here is the results from calculations where we use a non-unitary triplet pairing potential. This is um, something that was already proposed by Gosh et al. Uh, 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 for lanthanum nickel gram two, but we modify it with adding the linear dispersion to reflect the uh, topological structure. And then uh, we get uh, these eight bands here. So you, you see uh, eight, eight lines because you have now two bands, two spins, and then particular hole symmetry. As well, and what you can see is that we still have the uh, crossings of the Bogolibov uh, spectrum at the Brunson boundary. So the degeneracy is retained even in the Bogolibov spectrum. And so this is a, a, a conclusion for our results on uh, lanthanum nickel gram two. So we found this method to synthesize single crystals for the first time. And we found a non-symorphic non uh, space group. And that leads to uh, the fact that lanthanum nickel gram two then is a topological crystalline metal. And it has a Dirac line and Dirac loop at the Fermi energy and also uh, two Dirac points that remain ungapped even under spin orbit coupling. And, uh, and so we see that it's an example where topology in fact enables uh, a case of a fully gapped spin triplet superconductivity. And this last point, um, I wanna come back to one of the uh, slides in the introduction, right? Uh, initially, lanthanum nickel gram two really looked like a conventional superconductor, right? And you would not suspect uh, that this is the kind of superconductor that uh, would break time reversal symmetry uh, unless it had been measured, which was the case, uh, I guess, by, by enormous luck. Um, and uh, now we have this sort of uh, possible mechanism where this could come from non-symorphic symmetries. And so uh, that invites us to reinvestigate other superconductors that are non-symorphic uh, that have a non-symorphic structures, and in particular to look for uh, time reversal symmetry breaking in those, uh, in those compounds. Okay, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. Well, thank you, Valentine, for a very nice talk and for leaving a little bit of time for questions. Okay, so Jorge, you're, you're first and then Andre. 
Hi, Valentin. Thank you for a very nice talk and also for this Tour de Force you did in nine years, what took 37 years for uranium germanium. So that's great. Um, and it's very exciting what you've revealed about the non symorphic nature of the crystal and also the implications for the band structure and the superconductivity. What I wanted to ask you is the following. If you look at our non unitary triplet pairing theory published last year, and you look in the supplemental material, which maybe is too much to ask, but the Fermi surface looks a lot like the one you have here. Of course, it doesn't have that Dirac point, but if you look away from the edge of the brilliant zone, you have these Fermi surfaces that hug each other. And in our theory, of course, we don't have this nice degeneracy, so we need to overcome the gap between the bands, and that's why we need quite a large U, which is our single fitting parameter. So that raises the interesting prospect that what the, your Dirac uh, points are doing is they are bringing down this energy scale until it becomes possible to produce this type of pairing with a very weak pairing interaction instead of the quite large one that we found. Now, my question is, do you think this opens the view to keep the unified theory of lan the lantern of nickel carbon to a lantern of nickel gallium to, which we thought until now that they were very similar, but of course that one, as far as we know, doesn't have this non-symorphic symmetry. But perhaps if you have an approximately non-symorphic symmetry or similar crystal structure, or do you think they are completely different materials, these two superconductors? This is my oh. question. Yeah, uh, th thank you for for uh, for your nice summary of uh, of the of the uh, of the results here. So indeed, yeah, the, the the Dirac crossing essentially brings the energy cost to zero to create the interband uh, model that that uh, that you had proposed in the in the paper with Gosh, right? So this is uh, this is uh, this is the same thing. We just we just uh, add that it's a it's a Dirac linear dispersion. Um, and then to your point about lanthanum of nickel carbon two, so yeah, lanthanum of nickel carbon two indeed uh, looked really similar uh, initially in terms of composition, uh, but in terms of and and also in terms of uh, possible scenario for using this this uh, uh, int pairing, right? Uh, internally uh, anti-symmetric uh, uh, Cooper pairs, but uh, yeah, so. Your question is, what's my my opinion? I guess about is it the same physics? I I feel like it's 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 not uh, simply because it it's really two big differences. Uh, one that uh, lanthanum nickel carbon two is non central symmetric, and two that it's uh, it doesn't have the Dirac crossings. So those are two very big, you know symmetry based differences that I would be surprised that they have the same really the same mechanism. So you are uh, confident the crystal structure for Lanik 2 is correct then? I haven't I haven't touched any crystal Lanik 2 so I, I am not confident but but right. uh, it's not it's not uh, it's I don't think it's known to be a tricky case of uh, structure determination and like okay. unlike CMMM and CMCM where there was historical precedent for this, right? Mm. And, and uh, lanthanum nickel carbon two has single crystals that have been made. So if it was wrong- Yes, that's, that's why I asked, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sorry, Andre, and then Piers. Uh, Valentin, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I, I guess maybe I missed it. Maybe you could just, uh, say again what the conclusion was. So as I understood you, I wonder if you could show the, the slide showing the band dispersions, is that what the non symorphic symmetry guarantees is protected crossing of bands, even with spin orbit coupling included, at, at Kz equal one, like at the edge of the Brion zone. Is that what you call the nodal surface? Oh, yeah. Um... So what, is it a surface state or, or you mean just a nodal, a state that has a node everywhere at key is equal one. What exactly do you mean by nodal surface? So, so first, the nodal surface only exists without spin orbit coupling. So with spin orbit coupling, you only get this 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 line here 
which is which is the line the zt line the it's just a line okay. instead of that, the that's circle. right that's right. okay but let's say with um, okay let's forget about spin orbit coupling for now okay. right um what is the statement you're making when you say nodal surface are you referring to a protected crossing of the bulk bands or are you talking about the surface state like a drum head no uh, i'm talking about well uh, it's it's uh, it's the bulk bands that will cause this plane but you know it this is the because this is the zone boundary i believe that it's the, it's you know to get the surface state you just project it right so it at least along the z direction is the exact same as the surface um, right but it need not be at the same energy would you not agree imagine you're moving you're um, keeping this plane but you you change kx ky would you not uh yes yeah it might not be a um that that is the question i'm not sure I, I i know the answer to this but 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 let me let me come back just in terms of the bulk so the the fermi surface is never guaranteed to cross the the nodal surface right so you could have just you know a spherical fermi surface in the middle around exactly. gamma mm -hmm. and it would not cross the nodal surface and you would not have direct points but if it does cross the surface then it will be too far degenerate. And so here it crosses the surface uh, at many places. So you have this Fermi surface four and five that cross the surface here. And so they make a line, they become exactly degenerate and same on the other side. And then Fermi surface two and three, they, they form this loop here. Awesome, now, now I follow, I see. I see. And now what you're saying is if you add spin orbit coupling, that Fermi surface, the one you're pointing your mouse at, can technically split everywhere except the tz direction where it remains degenerate yes okay and so so you have even less luck to have a fermi surface crossing a line right you have quite a lot of luck of the fermi surface crossing a surface mm -hmm. you have less of it for the fermi surface to cross the line but here it does cross it right in the middle so we we're, we're fairly stable um mm -hmm and dub this and it will move a little bit, but it will still cause it. Gotcha. Um, well, yeah, uh, thanks for, okay. thanks for Let's summarizing. Have a final, final talk, a final question by uh, Pierce, and then we'll take at least a 10 minute break and then we'll have the next session where Yuji Matsuda and, and Takagi will be giving their talks. So Pierce. Valentin, a beautiful work. Um, uh, I was amused to see that your structure has is number 63. We studied a system, uh, non-symorphic system, serum nickel tin, which is number 62. Um, uh, and that brings me to my question. Uh, wh when you have um, uh, non-symorphic symmetry topological insulators, you get a Mobius, conda, an, a Mobius uh, topological insulator with an exotic surface state. Is there any predicted surface state for your superconductor? Um, yeah, I, I do not I, I do not know this. Um, a priori there isn't because um, it's um, well. Why I'm saying this is because if you look at the bulk Dirac semimetals, they don't have any, and you need to have the wild ones to get the the Fermi arcs, right? So here we have the uh, the same situation. Instead of being a Dirac semimetal, it's a Dirac metal, but uh, I don't see why we should have any kind of protected surface that apart from the ones that are in the bulk, I don't think we should have anything do, new. Do you have any surfaces that have still have the uh, non-symorphic symmetry? Because on those surfaces, you quite possibly have a novel. Oh, entry. I see. Uh, um, that was what happened in, in our prediction for serum nickel tin. Uh, uh, not that it's it, it's been observed, um, but it was a, a, a a possible consequence of band crossing in this non-symorphic environment. So it would be interesting to check whether it might have surface states in certain directions. Um, so you're saying I should look at the surface, uh, the symmetries of the surface. That that's right. If you if you um, if you use the non-symorphic symmetries of the surface, you get a new. Uh, I don't know whether anyone actually did the classifications for Mobius uh, superconductors, but it probably was done somewhere. And it, 
probably can just tap into that work. Yes, don't you need two non-somorphic? Do you need a, two glide planes for your Mobius? Yeah, so 62 is PLMA or something. Is it, is it that one? It has several, right? It has, it has a screw and a glide. Yeah, and so the, you need a list of two. two. This, yeah, this you need at least the two of them, which is perpendicular to each other. Then yeah, you can yeah. have such a surface state. I think CMCM has only one glide. Correct. In that case, uh, I think you uh -huh. it's the surface. If you cut it, it'll be just did a point at the surface. Good point. Okay, so maybe not then. Okay, worth double checking now. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank let's you. Uh, meet again at uh, five five Pacific time.